So fill in the blank. I live by blank. Now you've probably heard different things. Sometimes you hear a wise saying and you say, those are words to live by. So maybe so. Maybe we live by particular words. Um, Maybe sometimes we say, I live by the clock. Time marches on. Are there any days that seem like this? Maybe some of us, we live like that. You've heard it probably said, those who live by the will die by the sword. I truly hope that that does not apply to any of you guys, okay? I'm, uh, as I've been ruminating on this, I, uh, I thought, how can I best answer that? And uh, someone had once described me, and it, it may have been Mike Norcom that described me this way, that I sort of fly by the seat of my pants. You know what I mean? Um, now, turns out that uh, what we normally mean by that is we just do it by feel. There's no real plan involved, right? You just kind of go and you just hope that the right thing happens, right? Uh, now, r- truly, there are different personalities, okay? And me and Mike are great friends, but we are polar opposites when it comes to planning, okay? Uh, honestly, if you're one of those people that love to plan everything out perfectly before you take a step, let's just raise our hands right now. Just go ahead. I'm not raising my hand. Okay. All right. Some of you are that way. Now, and then the other end of the spectrum is, let's say the fly out of the seat of your pants type of people, you, uh, you just kind of go with it and hope it turns out. And when you, anybody, anybody, there's a few of us that are that way. Yeah. Now, not everybody voted there. Not everybody. So there's a lot of the middle ground, right? There's some of you that like to make a plan, but then doesn't always work right. I don't know. This is what I've come to. I was having lunch with Ralph Abraham, and and he agreed with me wholeheartedly that this is a common way to live. I live by trial and error. Can I get an amen on that? Anybody... Anybody there with me? I live by trial and error. You know, I, this question came to mind because there's this one of these texts in the scriptures that uh, where Paul is writing, and he actually he uh, he quotes from Habakkuk. He quotes from Habakkuk, and he, he will, we'll get to the quote. But this is this is how it leads up to it. Okay, here's the context. Paul says this to the people in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For the gospel, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. Now, I don't put myself in that category lightly of being righteous. Because I, in and of myself, and this is Paul's point, and many, many times he says this, that it's not about our righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. And any righteousness I have, any goodness that's in me at this point in my life, it is 100% Jesus. Amen? Anybody else there? But the righteous, when you have been counted righteous, you will live by faith. So, it's this statement that I want us to explore together. Because Paul, he first says, it's the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because finally God revealed His plan. God revealed that righteousness would come not by the law, but by Jesus Christ. And now that statement that was actually from Habakkuk years before Paul ever was born. This can actually now become a reality. But folks, 
I have to tell you that I can't say to you today 100% that I live by faith. Because so many times other things get in the way. I realize that I'm on a journey. I'm on a journey. And that journey started at my salvation, which was by faith. So this journey starts at salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 says very clearly, "For it, let's read it together. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. We are saved by faith. We are saved when we place our faith in Jesus Christ and on the sacrifice that we just celebrated. That is where our salvation comes from. But I think you'll all agree that that doesn't mean we're just boom perfect in our faith. On that day when I received Christ, I was 21 And it was an amazing experience. And a lot of things changed in my life. But I can tell you, I'm not all the way there. Even this many years later. Let's see, I'm 41 now. 20 years later, I'm still on this journey. From salvation by faith to living by faith. Let's talk about this journey. What is it? That the scripture says moves us along this journey. What is it that helps you and I come to that place where we live by faith? Because that is our hope. That is our calling. That is not only our calling, but it's our promise that we can, you and I, no matter who you are sitting out there right now, you can not only be saved, But you can come to a place in your faith where what originally Habakkuk said can be true for you. But do you believe that? Do you believe that you could ever live by faith? 100%. Your life is by faith. Well, we need to talk about that. First off, we're going to talk about what kind of moves us along. Where the scripture says this is one of the things that moves us along. And this is one of the things. And then we're going to try... To define, what, it is, what does it look like to live by faith? All right, so first, the scriptures tell us that one of the things that is a guarantee, every one of us who become a Christian, we are guaranteed these things. Trials and temptations. Have you had any of those? Yes? Me too. James says this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. In other words, so that you can live by faith. 100% of the time that you can actually come to that place where your faith is mature, where you are mature to where faith defines you. But these testings, these trials, they have to happen. Now, I'm not to that place every time where it says, consider it joy. I'm not there. I'd like to be there that when a trial hits me, I go, woohoo, I'm going to get mature. (laughs) Not there yet. Working on it, though. Another thing that moves us along so that we might become mature, so that we might live by faith. The scripture talks about the disciplines of a loving father. The writer of Hebrews quotes from the Old Testament, from the Proverbs. Here's what it says. This is the quote that later we see in Hebrews, but it's from this. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. 
The writer in Hebrews goes on to explain that it's not pleasant to get disciplined. It's not pleasant when the Lord actually intervenes in your life in a disciplinary way. But it is because he loves you. It is because he sees, when he looks at you, he sees the potential that he placed within you. He looks at me and he sees the potential, even through all the junk, even through my mistakes. And he says, I love you enough that I'm going to continue to shape you. I'm going to continue to mold you. And if you'll allow me to work in your life, these disciplines will have a good result. No discipline is pleasant in the moment, but it brings fruit. So definitely, when we're moving along this trail of moving from simply salvation by faith to a place where we say we're living by faith, disciplines of a loving father. And then there's this. We've talked about this many times in our church. Over the last three or four years, we've talked about that this is one of the fruitful practices of a congregation. It's one of the fruitful practices, in other words, of a Christian who will be fruitful. One of the ways we move, one of the ways we become fruitful is by taking a risk in mission and in service. That's why I tell stories about our different missionaries that we know and different people who are, who are stepping out. I tell there's stories that each one of you probably can talk about when you took a step, maybe not to a foreign country, but just simply a step that felt like a risk. A step that was maybe risky, but it was a step of service and it was a step motivated by your faith. And After you had done it, you find that your faith is deeper, that your love for Christ is deeper, and that your understanding of who you are is deeper because you took a risk. So, what does it look like? What does the scripture say? It looks like to live by faith. Well, I want to take us to just two texts where I think we get these clues. Because I believe Paul was on this journey, no doubt. But I think Paul came to understand this journey maybe better than many people. And I'm so glad he wrote it down. Amen? And so, first we look at what he said to the church at Corinth. I'm just going to take this out. But this is this kind of gives me a clue for he says, for we, as in the body of believers, for we live by faith. Sounds familiar, right? Not by sight. Now, what does he mean by that? He's he's in the midst of talking to them about being in the body and being away from the body and serving the Lord, whether you're in the body or away from the body, whether you're dead or alive, whether you're in heaven or on earth. Serving the Lord. And so he says, for we live by faith, not by sight. Now, when I, when I see that by sight, I just, it automatically, I, I think he's meaning more than just what my eyes see. He's using sight here, I think, as a metaphor for you and I, for an analogy for our whole humanness and our ability to figure things out. If there was an opposite to living by faith, maybe one of them would be trying to figure it all out on your own and trying to do it all in your own power. Now, God gave us these wonderful senses, right? Can we name the senses? There's five, right? Name them. Somebody, come on. Are we awake? Here we go. What? Sight. Hearing. Touch. Smell. And taste. All right. Now we, all of those develop and we learn to use those. But I tell you, if there was ever a day and age where we know you can't trust your eyes. I mean, you see things on the internet or on TV and you go, wow, that looks so real. I'm, I'm one of these people that I love science fiction. Okay. But I know it's not real. All right. 
But beyond just our senses, we have this tendency to trust our own devices. We have a tendency to just go by what we can understand, what we can see, what we can hear, what we can taste. Only what we can understand in our own thinking. Paul says we don't live that way because there's something more. Everybody say, there's something more. That's right. There is a spiritual reality that our senses cannot detect. There is a spiritual reality that you and I now, we are in touch with that. If we are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is now within us. There is a new spiritual reality in our life. And we need to understand that there are battles going on. There are, that we have an enemy that we can't touch, we can't feel, we can't see, we can't hear like with our actual eardrums. But it is a reality. And if we are truly going to grow and we're going to live to the fullest that Christ has for us, then we need to absolutely say, I'm not going to just trust what I can know here. I'm going to, in faith, believe that there's more. I'm not going to live by sight. I'm going to live by faith. All right, so that's one of the texts. That helps us to go a little further to understand what does it mean to live by faith. All right. Another one is in Galatians 2. Now, the Galatians were missing the point. This was a church that, that, that Paul had started. But Paul had, had left and he heard all of a sudden that the Galatians had become convinced that they needed the law and they needed all of this stuff and they needed to be good Jews to be good Christians and all of these kind of stuff was happening. And so Paul is writing to them and one of the most blunt books that you'll read that Paul writes. He is so blunt. He's very passionate, but he's very blunt. But he makes this statement that I love. I love this statement. And I'd love for this to become a reality that you and I walk in and live in every day. So here we go. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that something that you and I can say? Does it feel weird to say about yourself? I have been crucified with Christ. Say that to yourself in your mind. I have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? It means that I no longer live. The I, the me, myself. This is no longer important because this represents sin in my life. The selfish me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. God himself lives in me. The life I live in the body, this life that I'm moving around and the things I do, the whatever I'm doing in my day-to-day life, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What an amazing text. So what does it look like? Well, living by faith means not living by sight. Knowing that there's something beyond what we can hear and we can see and even what we can conceive. There's a spiritual reality that we're going to know that's there. So living by faith is not living by sight. And living by faith means that I've crucified self. That each day, instead of my day being filled with what can I do for me? How can I satisfy me? How can I be happy? How can I get what I need? How can I make more and have more and be more comfortable? Instead of it being all about me, it's all about Jesus. I've been crucified. And I now put myself, my trust Fully in Jesus. 
Now, why is Jesus deserving of that? Why can I do that? Why should I do that? It says it back here. Look at there. I live by faith in the Son of God. That last statement, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I live in that reality now instead of my flesh. Not by sight. I crucify myself. And I put my trust in Jesus only. So living by faith. I'm going to put it to you. That we are on a journey. And I'm so glad to be on that journey with you. You realize that the people sitting around you are on that journey with you. If you have put your faith in Christ, then we're all in it together. And we need one another. We need one another when the trials and the temptations come. How awesome it is to have somebody to walk through them with you. To put a hand on your shoulder and to say, I'm praying for you. Or to give you a hug. We need to understand that Sometimes these things are disciplines. And instead of getting angry at God, we can look to God and say, God, what do you want me to learn? How do you want this to form me so that I can become the man or woman of God that you want me to be? Lastly, if we're on this journey together, we're going to have to take risk together. As an individual, you're going to take risk to serve and to be on mission. But as a family, your family, you'll take risk together for the kingdom of God. And lastly, as a church, we're going to take risk. We're going to step out in faith. We're going to serve. We're going to do and we're going to go. But I'm glad we get to do it together. So that. We can all move toward this, living by faith. I'm going to ask the band to come on up. We're going to be finishing up the service here in just a second. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what God's doing. Whatever God's saying to you, maybe there's one of these things. Or maybe you've been going through a trial and you need some faith. You need some people to come and just pray for you. You know, we're here for that. Maybe you just want to come and pray by yourself. That's fine too. I don't know what God's saying to you, but I do want to encourage you to make a decision here. Go ahead and make your decision. Talk to God. And say, God, I want to live by faith. So the band's going to play.